All right, let's get into it. Welcome to this stay-at-home session for Intro to Substance Designer. Um, this stream was made possible thanks to New Media Manitoba. Uh, New Media Manitoba is the sector council and nonprofit association serving Manitoba's interactive digital media industry. And yes, let's make some cool stuff. Um, so I'm Brenna Blackman. Uh, a little bit, bit about me, I'm a local artist. I'm a senior surfacing artist at Tangent Animation, which is an animation studio uh, located in the Exchange District here in Winnipeg. Um, this is me. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm here to teach you uh, about Substance Designer. Uh, there's going to be three sessions uh, for this series. Um, just want to get out of the way right away that this is an intro, uh, intro series. Um, so it's directed specifically at beginners. So this is um, anyone who's never opened Substance Designer before or uh, for those of you who have maybe just you know not opened it in a very long time. So if you're tuning in and you're more of an intermediate user or uh, an advanced user, this will be probably pretty boring for you. Um, or not. If you're bored, it might be kind of entertaining for you. So. I don't know, uh, but I just want you to know that this is for beginners. Um, a few things that I'm going to make assumptions about, though. Uh, one, I'm going to assume that you know a bit about textures, um, so whether or not the final product is uh, for animation or for video games, doesn't matter, just that you know about textures. Um, and also that you have some sort of familiarity with PBR, uh, PBR materials, so physically based rendered uh, rendering materials, um, specifically for like the metallic roughness workflow. Uh, yeah. Um, also, uh, in terms of the structure for this first session, I uh, just want to get out of the way that I know the, the exciting thing for learning Substance Designer is um, getting into making like a really cool material right away, and we will do that, but we're not going to get into that until the second and third sessions. Today's session is um, primarily just about getting to know the UI. Um, we'll take a look at like what nodes are. Um, we will uh, look at some like frequently used nodes and ones that I think are interesting and then we'll get into a few examples. Um, but we won't be doing like full-fledged materials until next week. Um, I just think that it's you know, there's a lot of tutorials out there for uh, making lots of different types of materials, and those are useful, but I think um, skipping over the fundamentals and really getting like a familiarity with the software itself um, can hinder you. Uh, so we just want to just want to show you some of the bells and whistles like right off the bat. Um, yeah, okay, so with that out of the way, um, why don't we talk about a little bit about uh, the difference between Substance Designer and Substance Painter because some of you um, might already be familiar with Substance Painter and you already do texturing in Substance Painter and you're thinking I already have all the materials I need and I'm able to like finish these awesome projects with Substance Painter where does Substance Designer come into this? Um, yes, the video will be put on YouTube later uh, after this, so it's being recorded as we speak. Uh, but yeah, so, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no problem. So the difference between, uh, yeah, so Substance Painter, I'll just bring this up here, has all of these base materials that come with it, um, so you might be used to those. Uh, and um, if you need any more materials, you might go to Substance Source, which is this website here, um, that provides you with, like if you have a subscription, tons of like more awesome materials. Um, but if you want to make your own, uh, you would have to use Substance Designer. So Substance Designer is a material authoring software. 
If you look underneath um, these materials here, you'll say, see that they have two different file types. So there's the SBSAR file. Um, so those are the archive files that are condensed, so you can bring them into um, programs like Painter or bring them into uh, Unreal Engine or something like that. And then there's this SBS file, and this is your substance graph file. So these are the types of files we're going to be working with or working in um, for this series. Um, so aside from just making base materials and being able to make whatever cool stuff you want to make for your individual projects, um, you may also be familiar with things like smart masks or filters and brushes in Substance Painter. And you can make all that stuff uh, in Substance Designer. So it's super powerful, even if you only want to be like a like primarily a Substance Painter user, um, it's still super powerful to learn some of the ins and outs of Designer so you can make a bunch of cool stuff for yourself. So yeah, that is, I mean you're already here, you already want to learn it, but that's my little spiel about why it's important um, in a Substance workflow. So let's get into the UI itself. So here I am, I'm running uh, Substance Painter 2020.1 I think. Um, and this is what the layout looks like by default. Um, so if any of you have already been playing around, um, let's just go to Windows and hit Reset Layout. It's going to ask you if you're sure. So that we can just reset the layout and I'll be on the same page getting started. Um, and to start talking about the UI, uh, let's first create our first package. So to do that, we can go File New Substance or we have this S with a plus sign um, to create a new substance. And it's going to bring up this dialog box. Um, and you have a bunch of options here. So the first thing is it wants to know what kind of graph template you want. Um, we're just going to go with the empty one for now. And then we can give our graph a name. So the obligatory, hello world. Uh, and then there's a few other options here. Um, but all of this stuff uh, are things that can be altered later. This is just some like initial information that it wants to get the file going. So I'll hit OK. And you'll see uh, the UI comes to life a little bit once we do that. Um, and so we'll start in the Explorer and talk a little bit about what's available in here. So the Explorer is um, just like an outliner uh, that you would find in like another 3D software package like Maya or Blender. Um, and it houses all of the items that you need and all the projects that you have on the go at any given moment. Um, when you are publishing materials, um, you're publishing a package. And inside of every, any package, you can have a series of things. You can have multiple graphs. You can have images. You can have 3D meshes. Um, those things become what are called dependencies for your graph. Um, everything that your graph needs to hold on to or needs to know to function in any other program. But we'll get into that a little bit more in a second. Um, so if I were to right click on unsaved package, uh, it gives me some, uh, some options that'll help illustrate this point. So I can create some new stuff. So I can create a new substance graph. If I click on that, it'll bring up that same dialog window. Um, and I could select a different graph template give it a new name, okay. Um, what else can we do in here? We can also create a new bitmap or vector graphic. Um, so images uh, and like SVG files. Um, we can import things, so we can uh, import uh, bitmaps and vector graphics. And then we can link stuff too. So we can, again, link those images. Um, or link a 3D mesh if we want. Um, so some interesting things happen if we link a 3D mesh, and I'll just show you that. Um, so there are some 3D meshes or example meshes that come with Substance Designer. So I'm just going to highlight this here so you can see where you could... Um, uh, with, where you would have to go. This is the path. That's the word I'm looking for. The path to those files. Um, so I'm going to grab one of these. I'm going to grab the matte ball. Um, and you'll see when I add that mesh, it brings me, uh, 
or it creates for me this folder here for resources. So it would do the same thing if I brought in an image or something. And there's this drop down, and here's my map ball. So I'm just gonna, so you can see what that is, I'm gonna drop it into the 3D view. Um, before I show you some neat stuff with this, I'm just gonna go back and talk about um, the difference between importing some stuff, uh, importing these things and, and linking things. Um, so the big difference is just that if you were to import images or vector graphics into this project, um, it's basically like creating a copy of those images. So uh, they now, like a different version will now live in this project. Um, by comparison, if you were to link images or meshes into your file, they technically still live wherever you've linked them from locally on your hard drive or on your server uh, or wherever. Um, so if you were to edit those meshes um, or images wherever they are living, um, they would update in the file. But if you just imported those things, they won't update if you've, if you've edited them locally because what you have, when you import it, it's just a copy. Okay, um, so I talked about uh, earlier talking about Substance Painter and how you know you can do all of your texturing there, um, and that Substance Designer is for making materials. But technically, you could surface three D objects in Designer. Um, so if I right click on our mesh in here, you'll see it comes up with a an option for bake model information. I'm not going to spend tons of time in here. But I kind of just wanted you to know that Substance Designer has a baker, just like Substance Painter has a baker, and it's pretty good. Um, ever since uh, starting, like I haven't baked anything in Maya in a long time because I found Maya's baker to be very slow, and by comparison, Substance Designer was it was robust and fast. Um, so yeah, when we bring up the baker. Um, it will show you whatever materials are applied to the object that you have in there. So there is a material here. Um, you can see it's highlighting something, but for whatever reason, they didn't. Um, they don't have a name for it. Um, and then you can also set up a high definition mesh for baking, and it'll let you grab it from a file or from a resource. So file would be somewhere locally on your computer. Resource would be something that you've already linked, so you could bring in and use the map ball. Um, or you have this option here. Um, there's something similar to it in Substance Painter. Um, the use uh, low is high definition, so you can just use itself to bake. So I'll check that off. Um, you can set the size of what you want your bake to be, the image format, um, anti-aliasing, and um, I usually just set this to 4x4. And I find that it works. Uh, and then your UV set. Then for outputs, um, this is very useful. Uh, you can tell Substance Designer where you want your bakes to output and it will save there, uh, which is awesome. For whatever reason, um, and someone out there might know better than me what the, what the answer to this is, Substance Painter, when it does bakes, they live as like temporary files inside your project and you have to like, as a separate action, save them to a folder that you want them to be in. Um, Substance Designer will write your bakes directly to a location for you. Um, and you can also uh, set what you want your output name to be for those files. Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to jump down here to our baker's render list. So to bake information, you have to tell, you have to select your bakers and tell it what you want. So you can choose all the standard ones. So you can have ambient occlusion or ambient occlusion map for mesh. Um, you have like curvature, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we'll grab normal map from mesh because we said we're going to use the low as a high definition um, and hit start render and then it will render out our normal easy peasy um, yeah so one last quick note about the baker though that I think is neat um, so I use designer and painter a lot uh, but uh, there is one instance where I find that I jump into designer to do a bake even if I'm doing all of my texturing in Substance Painter. And that is when I need an opacity mask. Because again, for whatever reason, Substance Painter doesn't have an opacity mask for Mesh Baker, but Substance Designer does. Um, and I find this is really useful when I'm, I'm baking um, 
sculpts or 3D meshes to cards. So say I'm working on foliage and I've sculpted some leaves and I want to bake those onto a card. I could bring my card in as a mesh and then I can set my high definition mesh, my sculpt from ZBrush, and bake an opacity mask and it will project the, yeah, its projection will just create an outline for my opacity mask and then I import that into Substance Painter and put it in my opacity slot and then I I can see what my um, my cards will look like while I'm I'm texturing them. So yeah, that's it for the baker. We're gonna move on to some other things now. Uh, I'm just gonna do some cleanup. Oops. Right click and remove. Yes, and we don't need this boring empty graph anymore. Because if you notice the difference uh, here next to this graph symbol, there's no drop down, but next to this high again we actually used a template that has some outputs in it so it's showing me all my outputs underneath here so I'm just gonna right click and remove or you can select it and hit delete and it'll ask me if I'm sure and I am okay so that's it for the Explorer let's talk about the graph editor which where a lot of the work happens so this is where we're going to be um, dragging and dropping all of our nodes to make our materials um, there are, uh, so there's a couple interesting things to say about the graph. Um, one is, um, this graph here becomes our parent graph, um, which is an important distinction because a lot of nodes in Substance Designer are actually smaller graphs, so they become children of this graph, um, with the exception of these atomic nodes. So there's two kinds of nodes. There are operational nodes and there are atomic nodes. Um, and I'll show you the difference. I'm just gonna grab something. Go in the generators and grab a noise. Clouds two, we're gonna be seeing a lot of clouds two today. Okay, and then we also have these atomic nodes. Okay, so I have these two here. Clouds is uh, an operational node. So it, it consists, if I right click, it consists of a smaller graph. And to see that, if I right click it, it gives me all these options, and one of them is open reference. So I'm going to open that up. It's going to ask me about it. It will open up this, just like we have like a package here, it's going to open up another package called Clouds 2 and show me this graph here. And if we look inside, there's some effects maps, blends, uh, a bunch of stuff that ends in an output. Um, and you can see that here, there's one output here. But if I were to go to this blend node here and right click, I don't get that open reference option. And that's because um, atomic nodes are hard coded nodes. Um, they're like, they're nodes that are considered to be used very frequently, very efficient. Um, yeah, and they're just made of code. They're not made of smaller graphs. Um, yeah. Uh, so, the interesting thing about uh, another interesting thing about atomic nodes um, is that there are five different ways that you can bring an atomic node into your graph. So we saw one already. You just click it and drag it into your graph. You could just click it in this menu here and bring it into your graph. You can right click in the graph and go to add node and select it from there. You can hit the space bar and they come up again um, and you can put it in there. Uh, or you can go to the library, uh, which we'll look at more in depth uh, shortly. But um, there's a heading here for atomic nodes. And we can grab the blend and drag and drop it in here. And again, that's because you use, you'll end up using these nodes quite a lot. Um, there's two ways to bring in uh, an operational node, and that is by, as we saw before, um, going into the library and dragging it in, or hitting the spacebar, and if you know the name of the node, you can just start typing, and you can bring it in that way, um, which is my preferred way of doing, uh, bringing in most nodes, uh, operational or otherwise. Um, and yeah. Just a heads up, like in terms of knowing the difference between operational and atomic nodes, 
it doesn't really matter and I personally don't think of it that often but it felt like it was worth pointing out so now you know but it if you forget that distinction it's not really going to um, impede you very much okay um, there's a couple other things in the graph uh, or in this little uh, menu here um, so we have uh, this parent size so I have this if I double click here you'll show it'll show my um, some options in the properties panel here um, my graph is set to relative to parent so I can dynamic and we'll talk about relative to parent or absolute stuff a few times uh, during this session um, but uh, yeah because this is set relative to parent I can dynamically change it in here to be different sizes um, and we can see how that works dynamically if I bring in a node my graph is set to 4096 the nodes I drop in here, the children of this graph, also become 4096. Um, that's because uh, all most nodes, all nodes, uh, when you bring them in, by default, will be set to. They will also be set to relative to parent, which means it's going to inherit the size of whatever graph or an environment it's placed in. So if I were to switch this graph to be 2048, you'll notice that this also becomes 2048. Um, yeah, and there's a couple other notes here for keeping things neat and tidy. Um, so if I move some stuff around and I want to align them again, I can use these alignment options. And if I want to just make sure that everything is lining up with the graph, I can do that. Um, yeah, but that's it for this. Uh, let's move on to the properties panel, which we just kind of started touching on. So, um, Everything that you click on here related to the graph, including the graph itself, will have options that it shows in the properties panel. There's tons of stuff to look at. Um, so one of the things was uh, the output size. So up here it'll show you, you have a couple options. There's relative to parent, and then there's absolute. Um, so there are instances where uh, you might want to say that you want you might want a node to be an absolute size no matter what and then you could go down here hit absolute now it's 256 by 256 but I could increase that to 2048 by 2048 if I wanted to and then it wouldn't matter if I set this paragraph to 512 uh, I'm just gonna double click in the graph so it updates it here yeah so I could set this to 512 if I wanted to and this node is still 2048 there we go. Um, something worth uh, noting, you might have noticed, sometimes, like usually you should have to double click to have something update. For whatever reason, sometimes I find that I have to like click a bunch of times um, to get this to update properly. Um, to get the settings for your graph, just click a few times in, in like an empty space of the graph and it will bring up that stuff for you. To see the properties for any given node, you can uh, just double click the node and then there's another um, we'll see this a few times today there's another thing you can do where um, if you double click on this like double click on a node and we'll get into the 2D view in a second but it will show you uh, it will put <laughs> this node uh, it will it'll show you the output of this node in the 2D view and if you click once on a different node, you can have that in the properties panel. So you could start, I could start adjusting the scale or something of this and then see how it's updating that other, like the, the previous node that I double clicked on. Okay. So we've got the Explorer, Graph Editor, or the Graph, um, the properties panel, and we have the 2D view. So it's pretty straightforward. This is just going to show you uh, like the 2D output of any one of the nodes that you have selected. Um, if you hover inside the 2D view and hit the space bar, it'll show you the node um, tiling infinitely, which is good for checking to see what the tiling of um, your textures are going to look like. Uh, what else can we do in here? 
Uh, it'll show us the scale. Um, there's a, like, I'm going to be honest, there's a few other options in here for, like, looking at different channels than that, and I really don't use that that often. But you might. So, you know what's there. Um, more fun is we have the 3D view here. So, uh, I'm going to plug this into our normal, and right-click in the graph, and hit view outputs in 3D view, and now you'll see it's updating uh, these outputs onto this 3D object. Um, so it's still showing me the map ball because uh, that was the last thing that I dragged into um, the 3D view, but we have options for a, a bunch of different meshes. <laughs> I just selected one by accident. Uh, if you select scene, it'll show you all of these different options here. Um, I tend to stick with um, like the plain high res or lower. Uh, so going with like the rounded cube or a rounded cylinder. Um, there are these other options here from the plane up, but they are legacy objects, um, and I don't find them to be as good anymore. Um, and I'll show you why that is. The the new ones um, tend to be better in terms of topology and I think UVs. Uh, so I will show you with the plane high res. So let's do. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do, we have roughness, plug, the, plug this into the roughness, so we have something interesting happening. There we go. Okay, so we have this plain high res, I'm going to go into materials, default, and then go to physically metallic roughness, which is the material that we're in right now. And you'll see that it says parallax occlusion or tessellation. That's um, how it's interpreting our height right now. We're going to switch to tessellation. And nothing happens yet, but you'll see that something updated in the properties panel. And what I want to do is make some adjustments in the height here. Um, if I start pushing or increasing the scale, oh, <laughs> nothing's happening because we don't have anything in the height channel, which is down here. But now we do. So, going back, materials, edit, so without the scale on, we don't see anything. Turning up the scale, we start to see some tessellation happening. Here, I'm going to move the lighting around so you can see. Um, maybe it would be, maybe we went too soft. Let's try this and get some crunchy normals happening. Okay, cool. So, I'm going to go back to materials. Materials default. After you've done the physically metallic roughness and set it to tessellation, you can just go to default edit and bring this up. Increase the scale. I'm also going to increase the tessellation factor a little bit. And the tessellation factor is how much this mesh is subdivided. So, uh, I'm going to go to the display and wireframe. Things are going to slow down a little bit. Okay, so if I zoom in, you can see how much it's subdivided now. Um, if I reduce the tessellation factor, you can see it's subdivided less. So this is what it is by default. Now, if I were to go to plane, it's two tries. Um, so it doesn't work as well. Same thing, I believe, yeah, the cube in that, um, because of the way that it is subdivided, uh, I'm going to get rid of the wireframe here. See how it sort of like intersects with itself, but if I were to bring in the rounded cube, it tears a bit, but it still looks better than the other one. Wait. Yeah. There we go. So um, the 3D mesh that you end up using, honestly, is just dependent on what kind of material you're making. So I stick with like the rounded cube if I'm making wall type materials, um, the rounded cylinder for more organic shapes, uh, like rock and bark and that sort of thing. And then, I mean, if you're working on a, a ground plane, it makes sense to use a plane. Um, so yeah. Um, 
So to move around in the 3D view, you want to use Alt and left click. Um, to pan around, it is Alt and middle mouse. And to um, zoom in and out, it's Alt and right click and then pan up and down. To frame up your object, you can hit F. But if you want some quick camera angles, there's a bunch of options here under camera. So you can set that up. Uh, you can edit your lights, so you can play with the different uh, color of lights or add some lights. Then we also have the environment. Uh, I'm bring in the rounded cylinder. And there we go. <laughs> you can see it a lot more now. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back to environment, edit. Um, so in here, you have uh, whether or not you want to see your environment, so it's set to false, but if I were to turn it on, um, you can see the panorama map. Um, so this is an HDRI image, um, so this is image-based lighting. It's what's lighting our scene. Um, you can adjust the exposure in here if you wanted to. Um, and these things, these little buttons here will let you reset it to its default values. Uh, it'll show you what environment you have set it to, and you can ro rotate the environment here. But usually what I do uh, is the hotkey for that, which is control shift. Hold control shift, and then just move with your left and right with your uh, right mouse button. Um, so also, if you've messed with a bunch of this stuff and you don't remember where your exposure was or uh, where it should be, um, you can go back to environment, reset environment, and it'll reset everything for you. Um, and display, we've already looked at, we have access to the wireframe if we want. Um, there's also a bounding box if you want, or I think, yeah, the grid is there for you. Um, but I don't, I don't really end up using that that often. Um, and then also there's the render. So we've got our standard render, or you have the iRay render if you want to do some beauty renders. Um, but we won't be covering that in these sessions. We'll just be focusing on... Um, creating materials and publishing them, uh, but there are other resources on YouTube for creating beauty renders. I think Substance has some. Uh, they've got a, they've got a lot of great training content on their YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to switch back here. Okay, so that's the 3D view, um, and that just leaves us with the library. So let's go over the library. That's this section here. So the library um, is basically your toolbox. It contains everything that you're going to need, pretty much, uh, to make your materials. Um, there's a ton of headings here, and all these headings are technically folders um, that are filtering for specific types of nodes. Um, you can create your own folder by hitting the plus button here, and then to make it do something, uh, you need to add a filter. So you can either add a filter by clicking this circle with the plus on it, or the sphere with a plus on it, um, or you can right click and add a filter. Um, and then you have to define that here. Um, I've already made one. I'm just gonna get rid of this. Uh, so this is my library filter, <laughs> um, very confusing name. Um, and this is where I just put um, things that I've downloaded that I think are useful. It's not very full right now, um, but I'll just click on this and hit edit so you can see what my filter looks like. So I've just told it uh, that I'm searching for a URL um, and then directed it to some to my Dropbox. Um, so I create created a, a library folder and put it in my Dropbox so that um, if I wanted to keep nodes like this, um, it doesn't matter where I am, as long as I have an internet connection, pretty much, um, I have access to some favorite nodes. Speaking of which, there is the favorites area, um, and uh, <laughs> I clearly don't really use it that often, um, but if you do want to use it, uh, this was actually just from a test. My favorite node is not the comment <laughs> node, but if you want to... Uh, have a favorite, all you have to do is select one of them and then you just hit the star here and then it adds it to your favorites. So now I like blurs and I like comments. 
Um, yeah. Next we have graph items. So these are some other stuff to keep your graph neat and tidy. Um, comment, dot node, frame, pin. We'll use most of these. Um, and then we have the atomic nodes, which we've been over. And next are effects map nodes, which um, I'll be honest, I have not used much, if at all. Um, I am interested in them, but I just have not gotten around to learning how to, to use them properly. Um, so these are good for creating like more advanced utility nodes. Um, so they have the potential to be very cool. Uh, but I'm sure that there are other resources online um, that can show you how to use those if you're interested. Same with the function nodes. So these um, are very useful for making more advanced parameters um, in your material uh, to give your material, material more flexibility. Um, we will look at exposing parameters in this series, but we won't be using any function nodes. We will be using generators. So there's two types. We have noises, um, which I've seen described as like uh, more organic shapes uh, for manipulating like other no or you usually use them to plug in to manipulate other nodes. Um, same with patterns, and these are more like man-made shapes. So you have things like bricks and polygons and that sort of thing. Next you have uh, filters. So there's a lot in here. Um, first we have adjustments, um, which are very similar to uh, adjustment layers in Photoshop. Um, yeah, and then we have blending. Um, what's neat about these is there is a blend node, which we've already, like, I, I dragged in here when we were, where did I put it? Oh! <laughs> um, if you have a node, sorry, I'm jumping around, but if you have a node selected and you bring in another node, it will automatically connect them for you, so I've brought in a blend node and it, I put it right here. But anyway, uh, the blend node is like uh, the mix RGB node in Blender. Um, so it allows you to put in a, uh, something in the foreground, something in the background, and then you can put in a mask. Um, there's opacity options in here, um, in the properties panel, and then blending modes, again, that are, um, similar to what you would find in Photoshop. So you've got your standard, like, subtract, multiply, um, overlays, uh, but if you are familiar with Photoshop, you might notice that there's some options missing, and those would be... Uh, these ones over here. So we've got like your color burn and color dodge, uh, dissolve, those sorts of things. So if for whatever reason you want those options out of your blend nodes, you just have to get them from the library. Or spacebar and search for... Hmm. Clearly I've never tried to search for them before. I guess you can't search for them in here. You have to grab them from uh, your library. We both learned something just now. Um, okay, so moving on, we have blurs, channels, uh, effects nodes. This is where a lot of the fun stuff is. Um, and every once in a while, I think it's a good idea to just like, because the nodes in here are being updated all the time um, with each iteration of substance. And I just like to go in here, find a node that I'm not familiar with, drop it in to the graph and just try and figure out what it does. Um, there's a lot to Substance Designer that is just like happy accidents. You might start playing around with something uh, while you're trying to work out one problem and you realize that you've solved like a different one maybe for a later material. Um, so sometimes you can sort of force those happy accidents by just like actively going into your library and playing with things you're not familiar with. Um, yeah, and then we have, uh, here's where you find some uh, nodes specific to your normal maps. Um, there's some tiling nodes. Um, so these are good for, as I mentioned before, if you hit spacebar, you can see the infinite tiling of your uh, texture. Um, and if you at some point do that and you realize that you've created something that doesn't look like it's tiling anymore, you can use these nodes to start to manipulate um, the image to make it tile, or if you've brought in a bitmap that you're wanting to make tileable, these would be the nodes that you could use to start making that a tileable texture for yourself. And then finally in this section we have 
uh, transforms. And again, if you're used to um, manipulating stuff in Photoshop, some of these will seem familiar to you. Um, next we have material filters. Um, this is more for um, already finished materials. Um, so if you were like blending two graphs together pretty much. Um, but there is one in here that we'll end up using, that's the height blend, but I'll get more into that later. Um, and then we have the mesh adaptive section, which I think is kind of neat. So these, again, for those of you who have used Substance Painter, might seem familiar. Uh, they're like the smart masks. They're basically the same thing. Um, and you would use these. I'm just going to drag one into the graph here. You would use these um, on a 3D mesh that you've baked maps for. So as you can see here, you import an ambient occlusion bake or curvature, and then you can um, further like customize it with a mask or something. So if you're not um, texturing 3D objects inside of Substance Designer, um, these can still be useful because, um, like I said, most of these nodes, unless they're an atomic node, are small graphs themselves. So if you were interested in learning how to make smart masks for yourself, but you didn't know where to start, or you wanted to get some ideas, you could just pull in one of these um, generators, open reference, and now you have access to um, how Substance uh, did some of theirs. And it, so it's like a, a good mini tutorial on how to create some of these generators for yourself. Uh, just going to do some housekeeping here. Okay, uh, so that's it for the mesh adaptive. Next we have functions. Again, we're not really going to, we're not going to be using any of these, but we will maybe use some stuff out of the 3D view. So this is, if you wanted to change up your lighting situation, I'm going to right click view outputs in 3D views, what updates, what's happening? I plug this in and I'm going to plug, my blend is getting in the way. I want you to see what's going on. So I'm going to plug this in here. I'm going to go materials, default, edit. There we go, so we can see some stuff. And I'm going to go to my environment, edit, um, and I'm going to turn it on. Okay. So, um, right now we've got the panorama, but if you wanted to have a different lighting scenario, you can drag and drop the cave entryway in there if you want. As you can see, it's it influences uh, how this renders. Um, so you get a lot more green light in here. If I turn this off, you can see that. And I'll go back to panorama. You can see that. Maybe you want some like more orange lights. You've got the small apartment. So these will, depending on which ones you use, can significantly alter the look of your materials. So um, just like a small side note, um, some of like the panorama is good, but it does still offer like some color information in your lighting scenarios. So um, if you wanted to go completely neutral, there are some options down here like Studio 3 or um, I don't know. Yeah, any one of these. Um, and I believe if you want to, also, you could import your own. So if you're working on a particular project and you want to make sure things are going to look consistent um, in you know, Unreal Engine or in um, your Maya scene, you could bring whatever image-based lighting you have from there into here and then drag it into the 3D view. Um, next we have some... Okay, I'm actually just going to put that back. Uh, next we have uh, PBR materials. So Substance Designer does come with some preloaded materials. Um, you, in your library, could also um, save some materials from Substance Source or wherever, uh, or ones that you've made, and you could put that inside of your filter. Um, so you can have access to those materials too. But here's there's some basic materials that it gives you access to so that you can either crack them open um, and see, like use them as, again, like a, a sort of tutorial by seeing how they are, they're broken down or to use some of these uh, material filters. Um, 
and see how they work, you have some materials to work with, to, to practice with. Um, and then MDL resources and MDLs we're, we're not going to deal with, so you don't have to worry about that. All right, so that is the UI. Um, we've gone over Explorer, the graph, uh, the properties panel, 2D view, 3D view, and then the library. Um, but I'm going to be honest with you, this is not how I look at the UI when I'm working. So we're going to set it up now, and I'll show you how I set up my windows when I'm working. Because the cool thing about this is that none of these have to be where they are by default. So, um, for example, this 3D view, I could add it to any one of the, like, tab it on any one of these windows. I could throw it over here if I wanted to. I could put it down here if I wanted to. Um, I could just have it on another window if I wanted to. Um, and I actually do that sometimes with my either my library or my 3D view. But I want you to be able to see everything that I'm doing. So if I was working with one monitor, I usually put my 3D view on top of my Explorer. So I just hover on top of that. And that's because I don't go into my Explorer that often. So it's fine to me to have it hidden most of the time. Um, and then I also take my 2D view and I put that on top of my library. Um, and I do that because most of the time when I'm grabbing nodes, I actually use the method of hitting spacebar and then just searching for what I want. Um, and I know that if this is like one of the first times that you're using Substance Designer, um, if this is one of your first times you might not be used to the nodes, you might not know what they're called. Um, so I totally understand that. Um, but I will like make every effort to call out what nodes I'm looking for so that you know what I'm searching for when, uh, when I'm looking for something. But also this is recorded so you can stop and start it anytime later and rewind for anything that you miss. But I think this is a good technique to get into because I see it sort of like um, when you're using ZBrush and you bring up the brush panel, there's like tons of brushes there. Um, and at first you'll start clicking on the brushes and you get used to which ones you like. Uh, but eventually you start learning all the hotkeys because it's just faster. So that's sort of like what this is for me and why intermittently I'll go into my library and just like search for nodes that I've never really used before so that I make sure that I'm always keeping like fresh what's in there because I spend most of my time out here just hitting the space bar. Um, so yeah, that's it for the layout. Um, it is worth mentioning that, like, if I did make a mistake, and I just kind of want you to not, there we go, I'm just going to put that up here. If I, uh, close that by mistake and I need to get it back, you just go to Windows, and it shows you all the windows here that you have access to, and if I just select the 2D view here, I can get that back, and I can put it wherever I want. So I'm going to put that back on my library. Cool. Um, so before we get into some other stuff, there's one other thing I want to do, and that is I want to take you through making uh, a graph template. So when we were creating a new graph, we had all these templates here. You can make your own um, to have it set up however you feel comfortable. So I'm going to walk you through how that's done um, because I also don't love this arrangement. Um, so I'm going to just start fresh and remove this one. I'm going to right click in here, new substance graph, uh, and grab the PBR one. And let's name it, uh, I'm going to name it New Media Manitoba Complete. And hit OK. So this is awesome. These are all the notes that I want, but I'm going to move some stuff around. So base color being at the top is fine with me. I'm going to move all of these down a bit. Uh, and then if I double click, I can always keep track of what I'm clicking on up here. Um, so we have roughness and metallic. Those are cool to go up here. Let me give them a space of three because uh, metallic. Normal, yep, I'm going to move that down a little bit. I'm going to take the height and I'm going to put that one next. 
And then our ambient occlusion, I'm gonna put that there. Cool. Um, roughness, I think I'm gonna put into more of a, a mid value. Metallic is fine the way it is. Um, and then the normal height and ambient occlusion, I wanna tie those three together. So I'm gonna grab a dot node here. So this is sort of like a splitter. Um, or a reroute, for the, again, for those of you familiar with Blender. Um, and one thing that I find interesting about that is if you start typing reroute, it brings up the dot node. So I don't know if they're just trying to make it easier for Blender users or if that's where they got the idea from, but you can find it either way. So then I'm just going to take it and plug that into the normal. I'm going to plug it into height and delete this. And I'm going to plug it into... I mean occlusion, but I'm actually going to select this connection point um, and then hit the space bar and look for an ambient occlusion node. It's this one. And it will automatically add that for me. So I'm going to put it here. This is turning red because it thinks this yellow uh, connection point here is telling me that it thinks that this is um, a color instead of a grayscale connection and the ambient occlusion and the normal map here. If you look at these inputs, it's looking for a grayscale map. Um, so I can just get it to update by taking this grayscale node here and plugging it into the other side. Now it's going to update it. knows I mean they're gray. And if I were to select this, hit delete, now it's fine. Um, and I'm going to line that up. I'm going to make sure that these are lined up over here. And then these are over here. So the reason I'm being fussy is we're creating a template. So um, if I leave something out of whack, like over here, or <laughs> that's very extreme, but I leave something out of whack here and I'm likely to move it, like if I or move it back this time, and I think I'm likely to move it back every time, I may as well save myself time and get everything exactly where I want it. So every time I load it, it's exactly what I want. So that's why I'm being particular. Um, to explain this, uh, ambient occlusion node that I put here. So these are all outputs that I and like you end up defining for those outputs what type of map it's going to export. But um, to actually get an ambient occlusion, uh, there's this useful node here that basically takes height information. Oops. Louds uh, takes height information and generates an ambient occlusion from that, um, which is why we can have all three of these, at least at the beginning, for most materials, be the same. Um, like this node will convert height information into a normal, this is a height, and then this will convert height information into an ambient occlusion. Cool. So now we have it the way we want it, or the way I want it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back to the Explorer. Uh, and before we can make this a template, there's a couple of things that we need to check. So first is you need to make yourself uh, a folder for your templates. So I have my Substance Library here in my Dropbox. Um, and then I have a folder called Templates. You can see I've already done this test. And uh, actually worth noting, um, this setup that I got started with I was because when I was I was learning Substance Designer, I did a lot of tutorials from uh, an artist named Daniel Teeger. He's got a lot of really great resources out there, and he had a template um, that I really liked, and that's what this is based on. Um, so yeah, make yourself a templates folder, and then also um, we have to go into our preferences. So edit preferences, then you want to go into projects general and then it's going to ask you about templates here so I already have it set up but I'm going to click these three little dots so that we can navigate or pretend to navigate to a templates folder um, so substance library templates select folder uh, and then hit apply so now it knows where it's getting templates from and now we can save this package um, and we would save it to this folder so call it uh, 
Okay, so one thing I would just, um, just because I've made this mistake before, one thing uh, to know is that for the template name, it doesn't actually care what the package name is. The template name that's going to show up is what your graph name is. So just to show that, um, I'm going to call this New Media Manitoba. Stay at home. And we're going to call the graph New Media Manitoba Template. Uh, yeah. Mm, just in case I still have one in there, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to rename this, sorry. Uh, New Media Manitoba Template for real. Sorry, I know it's weird, but I, I don't remember. So now we'll know absolutely what template we're looking for. Now I'm going to hit save again. Um, and if we right click on this package and go new substance graph, I scan for new media Manitoba template for real. There it is. And there's a template. So we made one. Sweet. <laughs> um, cool. So now let's get into some notes. Are you ready to get into some notes? Hmm. <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay, hey, there's my background. I like Sailor Moon. Surprise. Uh. <laughs> sorry for. I'm just trying to find uh, the file I'm looking for. <laughs> Um, because I have something for you. I have this package I want to show you of common nodes. There we go. Um, so worth mentioning, uh, to open a package, you can do the file open thing or your recent packages, or there, you can just drag and drop something into your explorer and have it open. So here you have common nodes. <laughs> yeah, no time. Okay, sweet. So let's get to know some of these. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just put together a selection of stuff that I find that I use a lot. So we're just going to walk through these a little bit. Um, so starting with the noises, uh, we have a anisotropic noise, we have cells, fractal sum, um, clouds, perlin noise, and dirt. Um, I think. Every single one of these nodes, except for the anisotropic noise, has multiples. So I just put one here, but like, for example, if I hit the spacebar and I search for cells, if I spell cells correctly, it shows me four different options. Uh, clouds, I think, has three. Yeah. Uh, fractal sum has fractal sum one to four and fractal sum base. Uh, Perlin noise. Hmm. Perlin noise. Just says that one, but then has some 3D ones. Uh, and then dirt has five. But yeah, I end up using these quite a bit. Um, we use them even in this demo because they're they're good for quickly adding uh, all noise detail to things that you're working on. Um, next we have patterns and shapes. So we'll start with this big one here. Um, and we're going to do a couple of things with uh, this particular node today um, before the end of the session. Um, this is a big node. Like there, are, if you look here in the the properties section, there are tons and tons of options. It's very flexible. There's lots of cool things that you can do with it. Um, we could spend an entire session just looking at examples with the tile sampler. Um, in fact. That artist that I mentioned earlier, uh, that I got like my uh, first template from, um, he does have a whole uh, a whole tutorial for like a, I think it's like an hour long um, that deals specifically with a tile sampler. I'm pretty sure. Um, but then we also have the tile generator, which is um, it's like computationally lighter neighbor. Um, so it does a lot of the same things, it just has uh, fewer options. 
um, which sometimes is useful because as your graphs get larger, um, designer or whatever program ends up you end up putting uh, these graphs into has to do all these calculations as you're like moving parameters and stuff around and it can get really heavy. Um, so sometimes if you're wanting to be efficient, it's like if you can get away with using a tile generator instead of a tile sampler, it's good to use that. Um, if you can get away with having a node be at 512 resolution instead of 2048, then do that. Um, it's just going to make your file more efficient. Um, the distance node is a neat one. Uh, <laughs> But we're not going to, actually, I'm not going to get into that one right now, but we will use it, uh, I think, by the second session um, to do some neat things. Uh, the edge detect will find the difference between different grayscale values and create outlines for you. And then you have some options here in the properties panel. Um, change the edge width and roundness. Um, and then we have the flood fill, uh, which is an awesome node. Um, so that will, I'm going to go to the splatter circular to help show this point, create some disks. So the flood fill, um, like will flood a, like a solid, uh, object or a solid shape, sorry, with, um, coordinates so that then you can use a series of other fun nodes. These are, so the flood fill is the first step to all of these ones here. So we could do something like flood fill to random color and plug that in here and you can see it gives us some random colors. Or we could do flood fill to a random grayscale, which we'll be using one of the examples today. Um, or to gradient. Um, wrong one. This one. There we go. Okay, we get some random angle variation based on, like, per individual shape. So they're very useful when you're, you're trying to add, um, like, organic, an organic feeling to, to your shapes, like a less procedural feeling uh, material, I guess. Um, and then we have some basic shape nodes. So there's polygon and po two and polygon one. Um, the difference is just that one of them is a gradient and one of them is a solid shape. Um, so you can define how many sides it has. Um, I think it's just composed of triangles. So if you were to explode it, you get that. Change the scale. Play with the triangle size. Uh, which I think the exploded that doesn't work on this one, but it has something else. It has this cool curve thing that you can do. Um, the shape node is very similar, um, but it doesn't differentiate between like these. Uh, like it has all the options. It has gradients and solid objects, so you can have like the paraboloid or the disc. Um, there's some other neat things. We've got a brick. Um, waves. Uh, then we have the splatter circular. This one is fun. Um, so you can change a bunch of neat things in here um, to splatter shapes in a circular pattern. Who knew? Um, you can change our ring amount. Um, you can change the radius and you can make spirals. Where is that? Right here. Change the spread. This is a fun one. And then um, you can also input a shape. So if you design a shape somewhere else, you can plug it into this pattern input. And then you go to image input, and it will splatter that shape for you. Um, shape mapper is neat sort of like the splatter circular, but it will pull the shapes in towards the center. Um, 
So it starts out like this, or it starts out like this, but um, you can push those shapes out or bring them in. And just like that, we plugged in one shape to one other node. And if you were ever wondering how to make a flower, well, guess what, everybody? Now you know how to make a flower. Um, yeah. So that's it for patterns and shapes. And then we have a bunch of these adjustments. Um, and I want to get to some examples. So I'm just going to try and blow through these pretty quick. Uh, gradient map is just that. It allows you to make dynamic gradients. Um, you can make them either color or grayscale. So if I were to select some of these points, we can change the colors. And then if we were to plug a grayscale image in here, it will map those colors to the different <laughs> grayscale values. Um, there's also something fun where you can do a, like you can pick a gradient from anything. It could be like an image on another monitor or something from within Designer and you just pick there and look at that. I got a gradient. So it's a very cool node, um, very useful for when you're doing um, your base colors. Uh, Transformation 2D node um, will let you do things like scale. So if you hit Control Shift for a uniform scale and grab a corner or rotate or you can just like squish things in. Um, and when I was talking about uh, how you can change things to be absolute in your properties panel, um, this might be a case where like you've set this up but you only want this one center shape. To get that one center shape, you go to the properties, tiling mode, which is grayed out. You go to this one here and you set it to absolute. And then if you set it to no tiling, now it's not tiling. Uh, we're just going to click here to get rid of that. So we have that. Um, I could put a different, it's going to take the same transforms if I plug a different object in there. Um, and if we've done all of these transformations and, we're, and you're like, I went a little crazy, I don't like that anymore, I want to start over. Uh, just right click inside the 2D, two, oh wait, with transformation 2D selected, right click inside the 2D area and you can reset your transform. Um, directional warp. Uh, allows you to take uh, to push uh, shapes in different directions um, using other shapes. So we're going to take this one for example. You can see it's starting to move it a little bit here. And you can overdrive values in a lot of these things. So if you like, we pull this all the way to the end and it's only at 20, but I could put in 50 if I wanted to. Um, and then you can change the direction if you want. Um, the multi-directional warp grayscale is very interesting. Um, so it's basically this one, but uh, it's an improvement um, based on a technique that people uh, have used before, which is that if you're trying to give like a non-procedural, um, that's always the goal. It's like you don't want your, your materials to look super computer generated, right? So you want to make them look a little bit more organic. So you, you're always trying to like add some sort of organicness to it. So with the directional warp, something that you might do is you push it in one direction and then you might duplicate your directional warp and then push the object a little bit in a different direction. This is a bad example. Um, with that shape, I think I'm going to put in this noise instead and see how that works. There we go. And then we're going to have to plug that in here. There we go. Um, so this was uh, a way that you might go about it. And you notice that what happens is as we push the shape further and further, it starts to... Hmm... It starts to like go off to the side here, which might not be what we want. So what you could do is you could grab a transformation 2D, and then you could just like move it back to the center if you want to. Um, but ah uh, yes, okay. I have this set to no tiling. I'm going to grab this one and go reset to default value and undo all that. I was wondering why that was happening. Okay, so you see 
now, now that it tiles, as it gets pushed up here, um, it's starting to tile back underneath here um, and even further here. So what we could do with this one is push it back into the center if we want. Anyway, all of that to say, if we wanted to avoid that, we can use this multi-directional warp grayscale, which is a new node. And plug this into our input again, plug this into our intensity input, and I could set this to like 60 and move it around to 80, and it stays within the center. And also, I can warp it in multiple directions. So I can just do the one, I can do two, I can do four um, to sort of add a little bit more of an organic feel to that shape. Um, mirror, gray, mirror grayscale is a cool one. So again, I'm going to need the help of the transformation 2D to show you how that works. So if we were to plug in that and then shrink it down, move this over to the side, set to absolute again and no tiling. And then plug this into the mirror grayscale. You can mirror it. So if you're making complicated shapes, um, it can be very helpful because you could just focus on creating one half of the shape and then mirror it over afterwards. And you can do it in more than one axis. Um, and offset it if you need to make some adjustments. Uh, Non-uniform blur. Okay, this one is very cool. I keep saying that. They're all cool. Um, if we take this 2D shape, say you just want to like keep it simple for yourself and you're building shapes by just like um, you're not dealing with the gradients. You're just uh, blending a bunch of these these solid shapes together. But you want something you want to soften it out. You want to add, you want to eventually get something that looks like this. You can use the non-uniform blur for a lot of things, but this is one of its cool uses. If you plug this in and you increase the intensity and you increase the samples and the blaze, now you've created a great, like a nice soft blur for it. Um, and it's also still like the integrity of the shape is still there. So I, if I plug this into our template here, I'll be able to show you even better. So go materials, edit, and increase the scale here. You can see that. So uh, we've got this blur high quality grayscale. If I were to just plug this in here and then set the intensity to something like 32, it's blurring, but not only is it pushing the shape out, but you don't get something as nice. See what it's doing? So you don't really get the same effect and you, you might do that and then like take your levels here and try to play with it. I don't know. Try to get what you're looking for. Or you could just use the non-uniform blur and blur your shape on itself and you get a nice soft form. Um, okay, and the last thing I'm going to do is these histograms because they come up a lot. And I'm also going to grab the, I'm going to bring the levels back so we can talk about this a little bit. I'm going to grab clouds. So the levels uh, is just that. It allows you to play with the levels of, of the input that you give it. Um, and this here in the properties panel is a histogram. So something that you might be familiar with again, uh, if you're familiar with Photoshop. Um, and these nodes here allow you to manipulate the histogram. So you've got this first one, the histogram scan, which does just that. You can plug in your grayscale and scan the position of, for like for a uh, certain value to pick out certain values and then you can increase the contrast to create masks and 
and that and isolate certain values. Or we have the histogram range. Um, and to show you how that is usually used. So if I plug this in to my height, we've got all this, but maybe I think this is looking a bit intense and a bit crunchy, but I want to keep all of my values the same. You can use the histogram range to reduce the distance between the highest and the lowest values while still keeping the integrity of the shape. So um, first of all, if I gave it full range and had it at 0.5, these that will give you the original image. Um, then as I go down, you can see I can reduce it by quite a lot. And I'm technically still getting, like it's keeping the integrity of the shape. It's just, again, shortening the distance between the most extreme, like the highest and the lowest values. Um, and then the histogram select uh, is basically a combination of these two. And it's good for pulling out certain values to create unique masks um, in more like complicated gradients if you just want to get a, a certain area of it. So uh, first you can select like your position within the histogram and you can select the range of values that you want from that area and also adjust the contrast of that. So I can go anyway. Uh, yeah, I just find this to be very useful um, in a lot of places, but I'll, mostly in uh, creating, sometimes for like pulling out certain values for when I'm doing like my base color and that. Uh, cool. So that's it for my common nodes overview. Um, and we're kind of running out of time. So I want to do uh, some quick examples. Um, to just show you some of these nodes in action. So let's create, we have a new graph. So let's just use this one. And this is potentially our, our first material. We're not going to do a full material, but I'm just going to like show you some um, common forms. Um, and we've already done the obligatory hello world for our first file name. So let's do the substance designer equivalent of that, I think, and make a brick. Uh, and to do that, we're going to use the tile sampler. Um, and then let's set our X amount, something like And then this two, yeah, 14. Um, then we're going to set our scale to one. And it looks like one solid shape, but I promise you it's not. We're going to scroll all the way to the bottom and go to color and color random. Huzzah. Um, and then I'm looking for the offset in under position. I set 0.5. And now I'm looking for what with the tile sampler selected, we hit the space bar, we look for an edge detect. And it's going to hook that up for me. Very helpful. Um, and like I said, so it finds the difference between different grayscale values and uh, and it'll create an outline. Um, so the, my edge width set this maybe 1.5 mm. alright, you know what, let's start with 2 for now I'm going to always change it later uh, and then I'm going to reduce the roundness cool next thing I'm going to do is grab that flood fill I love this node um, I love this node because it didn't always exist. There was a time when flood fill wasn't there. Um, and then it was there, and it's great. Um, okay, so now I want flood fill to random grayscale. So we have that. And I want a flood fill 
to gradient all the way up there. I'm gonna plug that in. Cool, and we're gonna play with the gradient here. We're gonna change up the angle variation. Yeah, totally random. Um, and I'm gonna grab blend. And I'm going to put this in here. Are you ready? That's so boring. <laughs> uh, material, edit. Every time you have a new graph, for some reason, it like remembers that the tessellation factor is something that I want on, and that tessellation is the thing that I want to use, but I have to reset the scale. So anyway, here we go. Now we're starting to see some stuff. I'm going to set my scale to like, Four. Um, I'm also going to change this to a rounded cube because it's going to give me a better idea of a brick wall. Um, okay, so this is pretty extreme. So I'm just going to knock this back a bit. We're just trying to make it look natural. We're not trying to make it look that intense. So we're getting a little bit of variation in there. That's cool. And I think I also want uh, some of them to uh, be pushed in and out, like they were hand laid. So I'm going to multiply this on top. I mean, already, not fun. Um, that's the power of having the uh, ambient occlusion in there. It makes things look cool. Like there's color there, but in the 3D viewport, but it's, there isn't really. Um, so I am going to reduce that. So we got some subtlety in there. Cool. Um, another thing I'm going to want to do. Oh, you know what? This looks like it's tearing a lot. So to fix part of the way that we're going to fix that is I'm going to go back to what did I do just now? Oh, I <laughs> switched it to a blend. Uh, we need physically metallic roughness, default, and tessellation. Sorry about that. I'm going to change the tessellation factor to 64. And that looks much nicer. Um, oh my goodness. Ambient occlusion. Thank you. That's... <laughs> um, okay. Derailed by a pun. Um, what was I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm going to create a bevel. So hit the space bar, start searching for a bevel. I'm going to grab it from here. And the bevel values usually are very low. Um, so we're going to set that to like 0 0.03. So it's going to show us this gradient. I just want... Let's go two. That looks okay. Smooth it a bit. Mm. Yes, but maybe we need point zero one. And then we're gonna select this, and yeah, add a blend. So I just had to think about that for a moment. And multiply. And it's subtle. But I'm trying to get just this edge to not be like a sharp. Um, there we go. Cool. Okay, so these look pretty machined still. So uh, here's a quick way to add some chips and edge damage with a cool node that I should have put in that other thing, which is the slope blur. It's called blur slope in Substance Painter. Uh, and then I'm going to grab clouds. Nothing, because I didn't space bar. Clouds. And I'm going to put that into the slope. And I'm going to grab this edge detect 
for my grayscale value. Double click it. So a couple things that slope blur usually needs, lots of samples, and low values just like that. Uh, bevel. I'm going to set this to 0.2. No, no. 0.05. Maybe. Okay. So also, I want it to chip inwards. So we're going to set this to min. Um, if I were to set this to max, it's going to be all the, the values that are pushing out of the shape. And then blur is both. So I just want min. Got that. And I'm going to select this blend. And I'm going to put this on top. And hit multiply. So I didn't lie. See? We use all these atomic nodes a lot. But I don't want this um, these chips to go all the way through the shape like this. So I'm just going to reduce the opacity. on it. There we go. Um, yeah, I guess that's okay. Uh, okay, so a couple other things we could Maybe warp the shape of this a little bit. So right back here. Yeah. I'm going to go uh, directional warp. And I'm going to plug this in here. Um, and then I'm going to grab... What do I want? Perlin noise, maybe? Let's try that. Put that in here. Woo! Reduce the intensity. Hmm. Maybe I want crystal. Which is not doing anything. So let's do this. You see how it's warping it like a little bit? Just a little bit. I know that this is riveting. Um, yeah, maybe if I put a levels on it, I get more extreme or more uh, contrasty values. Let's do something. Alright, I'll go with that. Um, so if I want, I've got this node out here. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I can, I can, uh, so I've just put these nodes together here, but I want all of this to feed into it. If I hit, I hold shift first, then I click on this, I can drag it over to here, and it will set it all up for me. Um, okay, I want to add uh, some, just like some quick wrench. I want to do one other example after this. So let's do quick wrench by adding a blend and grabbing a clouds two, and we're going to hit multiply. Hmm. But maybe I want this. Yeah, okay. There we go. Increasing the scale to see it some more. Um and one thing that I want to do 
again to make this stuff look more organic. Uh, instead of having this clouds completely like uniformly cover the whole thing, we want to give the impression that these bricks were made individually, right? So to do that, there's a trick. Um, you can plug this into the input of a directional warp, and then I'm going to grab this random grayscale. Now if we look at this node, you'll see that those shapes are pushing around the clouds. So I can like overdrive this like that, and it's just breaking up the shape, so it's adding a little bit of um, randomness to it per brick. I could even like adjust the direction. And then we take that and put it in there. And it's gorgeous. Just kidding. This is way too intense. Uh, so let's reduce the opacity again. And you know what? I'm actually finding the ambient occlusion to be a bit distracting. So I'm just going to turn that down. Hmm, maybe we'll set this to overlay. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Our normal is very low. It's set to 1 by default. I usually have to set to something like 20. Ah, so I did overlook that when we were setting up our template um, that I usually have the normal by default set to 20 or even like 25. So now we can actually see some things. Um, okay. There we go. Cool. And then the last thing is we'll do a uh, height blend. And I'm just going to grab something random like another clouds three or something. So put this in the top, this in the bottom. It's here. And I'm going to bottom height priority. There we go. And one of the things I'm going to do is I actually have to change the values in here. So I'm going to put a histogram range on it. So that this is a bit more uniform, so they're not spilling. Um, and then I'm going to bring it back in. I'm getting a bit finicky. I'm just going to leave it like that. Cool. And we made some bricks. Um, so it's 7.30. Uh, are we cool to stick around for one? I can do one more quick example. And then maybe we'll get into some questions. Oh, dear. How do we feel? One more example? Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to rename this. We'll call it Brick. <laughs> okay, sweet. Uh, let's just, we'll keep this one quick. And um, let's make a rock shape. Because I think it's that's a useful one to know. Um, so I'm pretty sure, because we've had to do this already a few times. Uh... We're going to have to increase the scale, so I'm going to set this 
right away to six. I'm going to change my shape to a rounded cylinder. And we're going to bring back uh, the tile sampler. I have a question. Do I paint it in Painter? Oh, the bricks? Oh, okay. So I should clarify that right now I'm just showing you, and I, I was going to get more into this in the second session, but I understand the confusion. Um, so for the workflow for Substance Designer, the best thing to do is to start with your height. Um, so we'll go in order of building up our shapes um, for our height first. Then you start building your roughness, and uh, then it's a good idea to start working on your color. Working on, the, on your base color too early can be fairly distracting. It's good to make sure that you've got like all of your forms working properly without the need for color. Um, yeah. So we will apply color uh, in the third session to the material that we end up making. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you could probably make like a height only uh, or normal only material and then do the hand painting and painter if you wanted. Um, does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, cool. So let's make a like a cliff face or something. Um, so I'm going to grab a polygon to start. Um, and I'm going to give it five sides. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know what? I will show you real quick. Um, if I grabbed a uniform color node, um, you can use that for color or grayscale. That's what these are here. And then let's grab like a dark brown um, and maybe and duplicate it and grab. And then a blend node. We're going to put this on top, this on the bottom, and use our, I use this color. Um, let's brighten that up a bit. There you go. And then also using that gradient map. If I wanted, we could like, I'll just grab this clouds and then gradient editor, pick gradient. Um, you know, let me find a brick online, not the brick, the store, just a brick, uh, and, sorry, okay, we got this here, I want you to be <laughs> one monitor, I want you to be able to see what's going on in the 2D view, and then also what I'm going to do here, um, oh, holy moly, it's not gonna let me do it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna pick a gradient from one of these images. I'll have to figure out what to do with that later. Oh, I'll use pure ref next time um, to show you. But anyway, so it's taking information from this gradient here, applying those colors to the different uh, grayscale values. And I could plug this in here. And it's a quick and easy way to get slightly more realistic colors out of your bricks. Cool. So that's that. But we'll get <laughs> more into that later. But yes, it's usually the last step that I, I do is the color stuff. Absolutely. No problem. Um, okay, so I'm excited to show you all of that stuff. I'm just trying to like um, slowly like move in like a particular order, but I'm like, I can't wait.
to get into that stuff. So no problem. Um, okay, so I want to adjust the levels of this a little bit. Sorry, we're going to look at this in the 2D view. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Um, I'm going to add a slope blur, and I'm going to grab, oh, oops, there we go, slope blur, clouds, and then we're going to Decrease the samples, uh, maybe just decrease the, decrease the samples on this one, and then bring the intensity down. Um, then I want a directional warp, but I'm going to use the multi-directional warp this time. And I'm going to grab that crystal, this crystal. And I'm going to increase the intensity, just to break up the shape a little bit. I think I'm only going to go in two directions. That'll work. I want that to blur a little bit more. Okay, and then I'm going to do, plug this into the tile sampler. And now instead of using a shape they already have. We're going to go to pattern input. So we have all these here. And I wanted to do this first so you can see my thought process, process behind uh, the, the next node I want to put in here. So if I were to uh, increase the scale, see how it's all starting to become one solid color? I want to grab a gradient, linear one, and I'm going to blend that on top of the shape. And I'm going to set it to multiply. Um, and to better see what's going on there, for real. <laughs> oh, right. Okay, again, this is why it's super important to set up your template properly the first time. I have to set this to like 25. And there we go. Now we can see something. And. I feel like my tessellation isn't working properly because it's not. Uh, six, is that what I set it to? Let's, let's set it to seven. Okay, so now you can see it's sort of like slanting in one direction. Um, I'm going to get it, I want it to go this way. So I'm going to rotate it. There we go. So now they're all going to kind of layer on top of each other. Um, so I'll plug that in here. And then, I know it doesn't look like anything yet, but trust the process. We're going to make these um, longer or wider than they are tall. You do that. You can do that here by either changing like the X amount, but you can also change it in the size down here. So I'm going to randomize the size a bit. Um, so Y is going to be a bit random, and the X is going to be a bit random. Then I'm going to keep increasing the scale. Um, and scale random we're going to play with here. Position random can get really crazy really fast. And so for this one, I just want it to be at like 0.1, just to get like a little bit of jittering. Uh, I will set the offset to 0.5. Um, some, I don't really want the rotation that random on this one, so we're just going to do a little bit there. Um, and then I want that color random again, which is here. not really looking like anything yet. Oh yeah, you're right, it does look like a like a close-up of a hair follicle. <laughs> Pantene, yes, that's what we're working on. Um, 
an ad for Pantene. Uh, and give it a, a rotation direction. Um, I think what I want to do is, yeah, there we go. Increase the size a bit here. And mm -hmm, I think my size random could be better. Cool, I'm just going to leave that for now. Uh, oh wait, maybe my scale a bit, because I've got some... <laughs> you're pointing at my screen and you can't see what I'm pointing at, so I just have to point here. But uh, increase the scale some more here. There we go. Uh, and I could also play with a random seed here. There we go. Alright, we're getting somewhere. Um, okay. Now let's add some noise. So I'm going to add another slope blur. Another clouds. Just to sort of get the point across really quick. Um, intensity, okay, samples up, intensity down. Um, So something I was going to mention before, uh, but I'll, I'll mention now, is that you usually want to go more subtle than you think on a lot of things. Um, something that I notice a lot on uh, like early materials um, is something I like to call uh, look at me normals. So like when we go through the process of um, making materials and putting in little details, um, I know that compulsion of like, I want people to know that I need to put this in here. And so sometimes we can like overblow certain things to make sure it's visible. Um, but usually all people end up seeing if you, you know, put in that extra, like if I were to increase my intensity, like really strong. Um, usually all people end up seeing is like, they really overblew, like their normals or normals look crunchy. Um, generally for those details that you really want to get in there subtlety goes a long way like and showing showing off that subtlety is usually like way more impressive um we will end up talking about some of this stuff uh and how i like look at reference and break down materials in some of the other sessions but i thought it's worth showing here because i am doing a lot of like adding noises and then scaling them back um and yeah, it's just something through practice practice that I've noticed is that you usually want to go like scale back um, more than or like decrease intensity more than you want to increase intensity on a lot of things. So I'm do that, and then I'm gonna go back and set this to like. Oh dear, these puns. And then I want to add some like pock marks. So I'm going to do the same thing I did. <laughs> uh, I'm going to grab that directional warp and I'm going to use its own shape. And I'm going to um, push this, this dirt's, <laughs> this dirt's, uh, this dirt. Uh, noise around so that it feels like it follows the shape of the rock. And then I'm not going to leave it like this. I'm going to, I want it to cut in. So we're going to subtract. And then as always, we're going to knock that back a little bit. So, I mean, it's definitely not perfect, but it's a start. Um, and then something fun we could do is uh, we could maybe duplicate this whole thing and maybe I reduce the sides on it or 
increase the slope blur, blur on this a little bit or something. And then we're going to go to the um, pattern and we can change the pattern input number to two. And that gives me another slot there. I'll plug that in. And it just adds a little bit more variation to this thing. Or I could rotate this a little bit or something. Add more sides if I wanted to. I'm whispering. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. Um, yeah. So that's how you can make like an organic rock shape. Look at that. And you just play with some of the parameters until you like the direction that you have. Um, cool. Wow. Okay, so it's almost 8 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, yeah, that's the rock. We looked at a brick. We looked at, like, the whole UI, and we talked about nodes. Um, and I know it's late. Um, I'm willing to stick around and answer some questions if there's anything anybody wants me to clarify and go over. Um, next session, uh, I, we will take a look at um, starting another material, and we'll take that through, I think, to the two sessions. So we'll spend, like I plan on spending the next session mostly working on a really solid um, base, and then like doing the height like we did here, but on something a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm also going to like bring in the reference and talk about how I break that stuff down um, and how I think about the reference when I'm getting started. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you have any, if there's anything that I went over pretty quickly today that you were wondering about, um, let me know and I'll, I'll answer those questions for you. But thanks for tuning in. This was fun. going to wait just a little bit. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. No problem. Um, I'm just going to take a look. Make sure. Yes. It says it is recording, so. Oh, no. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Ash O K D Hawan. I'm sorry. This is like my first stream ever. So this is also the first time I'm trying to read people's screen names in real time. That's awesome. Be happy drawing. That's exactly what I wanted out of this. Cause designer is it's like a steep learning curve but it's super fun. Um, so it can be intimidating to get intimidating to get into, but I love it. I want more to, more artists to give it a shot. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, thanks again for coming. Um, and like I said, this will be up on YouTube. Oh yeah, there's so much you can do with, with designer. It's huge. There's so much I, I still have to learn about this program. Like I said, I haven't even gotten into like functions and that. So lots of flexibility. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>